Hello everybody and welcome to week 10 of building scalable distributed systems. This week's topic is going to build upon the, the information we coded in the last two sessions, mainly on communications. As you saw in the, the last session, we were starting to talk about communications paradigms such as synchronous and asynchronous messaging. And these are widely used in applications. And over the years, what has happened is that these communication paradigms along with supporting services have been built into a set of technologies which we collectively call middleware in this class. So middleware is really the plumbing or the wiring for many distributed applications and it provides out-of-the-box services for applications that wish to exploit distributed systems. Typically, these middleware platforms will insulate you from the underlying operating system. And there's a lot of variety in this space. Um, different vendors, there's open technologies, standards technologies, proprietary technologies. And so we'll just cover a little bit of the, the space, give you an introduction, a high level overview of some of this. And then in the, the reading and the exercises associated with the, this module, you'll look into some of these in some more detail. Here's just a very simple classification of the, the areas of middleware. At the bottom there, you can see there's some sort of transport layer, which is essentially a way to connect the, the systems in a distributed system, connect the nodes in a distributed system. On top of that, there's application servers, which typically enable you to implement the APIs that a, a distributed system uh, supports. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, message brokers do something similarly. Uh, but have a slightly different purpose, as we'll see. And on top of this, you'll also see things called business process orchestrators or workflow systems. And these enable you to orchestrate, describe workflows across a number of distributed systems. And these technologies will then try to ensure that messages flow according to the workflow that you design in your, in your application. So let's just go through these very, very quickly. And we'll start with uh, the transport layer and a technology called Corba, which I'll just mention here for historical reasons as much as anything. Corba came from uh, the the OMG, the Object Management Group, in the 1990s, uh, and it enabled you to expose objects initially C++ and then Java and a couple of other languages across the internet or across a distributed system and make remote remote object calls, essentially remote procedure calls, as we've covered in previous sections. Uh, it had a reasonable amount of techn technological success in the early mid 1990s, but it faded somewhat in the late 1990s and early 2000s because it was just complex to implement. You'll still find it in telecommunications and defense. So if you end up working in those areas, you may bump into some Corba technologies. But in general, you won't see this in scalable enterprise systems. So it had many services. There was a directory service, a notification service, a transaction service. It was typically a synchronous technology, and there was an attempt to build an asynchronous technology. And so it suffered from all of the uh, downsides of, of synchronous technology and tight coupling and so you'll st I said you'll still find remnants of this technology around and some of the code from Corba still underpins the Java um, J2EE, JEE services that, that are available such as RMI and the Java transaction service we'll talk about very briefly in a minute. Messaging is again another essentially a transport layer mechanism, but this is a synchronous mechanism enabling you to send messages between two applications via typically some sort of queue. It's a send and forget mechanism. You send the messages to a destination and they get delivered somehow, hopefully. Uh, you can normally specify whether the messages should be reliably delivered or if something can cause them not to be delivered. There's also options for transactional messaging so that things can be committed both to uh, multiple endpoints, multiple databases perhaps, um, and 
this is available in many systems and uses essentially the same two-phase commit protocol, the XA protocol that you'll see in, we talked about in, in databases. And you can also specify that messages can be persisted at whatever queuing technology they live at. So that if that's, that server should fail, the queue server fail, then the messages can be recovered. So basic messaging is just has two real operations, send a, a message to a queue and receive a message from a queue. And there's no dependency on the state of the receiving application from the sender. So the sender can happily send away, even if the receiver is not listening, uh, with the hope, intent one day, that the receiver will wake up, pull the messages off and process them. So some thoughts about this, it's highly attractive, it's asynchronous, it decouples the senders and receivers and it enables you to build dynamic applications because senders and receivers can come and go. It scales well, especially if you can scale the queuing infrastructure, maybe by distributing it across multiple servers. And there are many implementations, both standards based and proprietary, IBM's MQ series being the classic. But you'll find queuing services available on AWS and all your major cloud platforms. Publish, subscribe kind of extends message oriented middleware to provide one to many many to many communications as we talked about last week messages are published to topics or subjects and receivers subscribe to that particular topic that logical topic and receive all the messages that are pushed to it very attractive very flexible technology it's decoupled because the publishers don't know who the subscribers are and the subscribers typically don't care who's publishing the messages um, issues you don't always know if the, the messages are going to be reliably delivered transactions and security are tricky in this realm uh, transactions think it's one to many how do you handle two-phase commit in a one to many trans uh, one to many communication security also a little bit tricky how do you secure the messages when there are potentially many receivers and performance, of course, if you can scale these technologies by pushing the queues across multiple servers, uh, you get much better performance and scalability. And again, we'll look at a technology called Kafka in the next session, I believe, which has looked at scaling published subscribe technologies using some novel ways. The Java Enterprise Edition, formerly known as the Java 2 Enterprise Edition, is a, a full suite of middleware to enable you to build distributed client server systems essentially you can see it has a web server and at the business component layer it has things called enterprise java beans these live in a container container is essentially a runtime environment a java runtime environment which you can invoke java beans you can host and invoke java beans uh, and these Java beans can exploit the services of the container, as the slide says. There's things like uh, the Java transaction service, so beans can participate in transactions when they talk to databases via JDBC. There's also the Java messaging service, so you can have thing called things called messaging beans, which receive messages asynchronously and process them. The important thing is that the, the beans, the components as they're called, are hosted and managed by the server and this is the whole intent of this is to try and simplify the programming model that's associated with these complex applications and we'll look at this in more detail in the class the beauty of jee is it's standards based and there are multiple vendors um oracle being one glassfish we'll probably use in this course um jboss ibm has its own web sphere implementation and there are many others uh, it's excellent open source technologies are available, but you can get one from a vendor if you want. It's Java only. Um, performance varies across suppliers. You, there's no such thing as JEE performance. Performance is always dictated by the actual implementation of the technology that you are using. You can scale this thing through um, replication and you can have high reliability because most of these technologies have failover. So when something fails, messages can get routed to a replicated server. So the aim is that it simplifies enterprise systems development. And many of the components of JEE live in highly scalable systems around the internet today. 
Let's just look very briefly at a technology called message brokers, or as we'll see, enterprise service buses was a marketing moniker that was invented for these things at some stage. No one's really sure what an enterprise service bus is, so we won't really talk about them. But let, here this slide's depicting a scenario where a web service is pushing some message into a queue in a format which it understands. And this message is to be consumed by four legacy systems. So these could be old things, old COBOL systems, old Oracle systems, old RPG systems, if you've ever heard of that, that weird IBM technology. Um, doesn't really matter what they are, but they all have to input that message and process it. And the message is dictated by this modern web component, which we've uh, recently integrated into our system. The legacy systems were not designed with any knowledge of this message format, the in format as it's called on the slide. So what they have to do, each of these legacy services, legacy systems has to, as the box that's just expanded shows, have to read the input format from the queue transform that new format which they were not designed to process into a legacy format which they are designed to process and that legacy format is used to make the api call to the local legacy system and each one of these legacy systems is different so they have to do their own thing each one will basically follow this this pattern they'll transform the message into a format they understand and apply it to their api So what happens if this in format message changes? We change the format, the web component decides to add a field to it. What do we have to do? Um, what happens if the legacy system APIs change? And what, this all gets rather complex in this scenario because we have to make changes to every legacy system. So an alternative scenario is to introduce what's known as a message broker. And the message broker acts as a, a centralized repository of knowledge for the formats and connectivity in these systems. So the web component publishes the message to this intermediary message broker. The message broker knows when this message arrives, which systems it has to transmit the message to. And it also knows the message formats that are native to those legacy systems. So in the broker itself, it performs a transformation. And the legacy systems then just see messages that they are designed to process. We don't need to make any changes to the legacy systems. So the beauty of this is we're simplifying the endpoints. We're embedding the transformation knowledge into the broker and we're decoupling the web and the legacy components completely because the legacy components have no clue that this web component is publishing these messages. So these, this architecture and the resulting message broker technologies were published in the, the time when enterprise application integration EAI was all the rage and we were integrating systems both within enterprises and across enterprises to, to build highly heterogeneous widely integrated business systems as you see we, the these message brokers typically are built on message queuing technologies and they add a message transformation engine, some sort of simple programming rules and routing so that a message can be routed to an endpoint based on its content perhaps, and adapters to give you the ability to connect to a wide range of say databases or CRM systems or SAP systems or whatever. And this tech, range of technologies is often known as enterprise service buses, but as I said, no one really knows what that means. So message brokers have message transformation capabilities, and these are typically supported by some sort of graphical pro programming language or tools. They can route messages intelligently based on contents, and there's some sort of typically a proprietary scripting language embedded in these brokers so they're essentially programming 
And they typically form a hub and spoke architecture, whereby the broker becomes the, the, the hub in a system. All the input messages are sent to it, and then it, it emits output messages to the resulting legacy systems. So obviously, being a hub in this sort of architecture, if you can't replicate these beasts, then they're a potential bottleneck and hence a, a limit on scalability. Here's an old example of the sorts of programming, language, programming environments that you see in a message broker technology, this one from IBM. Here you can see that we're getting some inputs from an MQQ, we're doing some filtering, and then the, from the filter it goes to some compute nodes, and then eventually it sends messages to MQ reply queues, and eventually it gets to something called publication one, which is an endpoint, which is the, the destination for many of these messages. And so that's a typical example of the way you, you program the logic in a message broker. They also typically have transformation engines. So here you're, sh you're saying that when a particular schema comes in to the broker from an endpoint, we should transform it to another type of schema. And here's the way the transformation works. So we can graphically draw that the ID from the input goes to the ID of the output. The date goes to the date of the output and the order quantity goes to quantity in the output and, and in the middle there you can actually program functions which can do programmatic transformations between inputs and outputs this example is from Microsoft's BizTalk again quite an old example but very illustrative of this technology class so message brokers some thoughts on them they're really nice because you can embed transformation and routing in the broker but the downside of this is if it gets if the system is complex then the brokers get really complex and they become an a, an area of your system which become hard to change they also may introduce scaling problems because you somehow need to replicate the broker and how that occurs depends completely on the technology that you're using and these things are often proprietary, even though there are good open source standards. We used a technology called Mule uh, widely, and that was excellent Java-based technology, which you can still find lurking around the internet and download. Another technology class in this area is workflow or business process management, it's often called. And there's two main standard languages in this space. One, BPEL, which is a web services business process execution language, I believe it stands for. And it's a web services standard for describing workflows. And the, the sort of workflows you describe in BPEL or BPMN, which is another standard that was produced by the object management group. They typically look like this on the right here, where messages are processed, there's some sort of decision logic in there. It looks very much like a flowchart. And these boxes in there can actually be real systems. They can make calls to, to databases, wait for results, and then pass on the, the results to the next step in the system. And typically there can be many messages flowing through these workflows at any one time. Uh, you will find workflow technologies in the Amazon cloud, for example, and I'm sure you'll find it in the Google cloud and, and Azure as well and other competitive technologies. The ability to graphically describe and then have an engine orchestrate messages across multiple endpoints is actually very powerful. And when built on a, a cloud-based technology such as AWS, you can also incorporate the scalability that you need to process your workload. So in summary, middleware is basically just this range of technologies which attempt to embed in componentry the sorts of patterns and communication paradigms and services that we've discovered make building distributed systems much easier. So you basically buy or download a big chunk of software and you embed your logic into your application. And what's running is that the, the total amount of code that's running is typically very little of it you have written yourself. Most of it you're running the actual componentry, the middleware platforms and technologies that, that you downloaded or acquired. 
And the architect, the designer's job is to mix and match these technologies to provide appropriate solutions, bearing in mind the trade-offs that you have to satisfy to, to meet the requirements. One word of advice here is that you know, there's no good and evil in this world. It's just technology. Um, some people have very strong biases to certain types of solutions, certain types of vendors. And this is really not a good way to think about designing systems. Be open minded, experiment, prototype and come up with the best solution to meet your needs.